Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're glad to be here with you this, this evening. I'm Kenny Stallard. I'm on the uh, bo uh, board of directors for the Friends of the Archives to keep Fort Library. And this program that you're going to see this evening is a lot of the photographs are featured in this book, new book by Brianne Johnson, the, li the archivist, and they're on sale at the library for $22. Proceeds goes to the Friends of the Archives so that we can support programs Martha. for the uh, archives. Now, if you've been out and seen the uh, Keysport yesterday and today at the uh, Renaissance Center, that was one of our programs. So, visit it. Christmas time's coming. This is a wonderful gift if you have kid folks out of Kingsport that love old Kingsport memorabilia. So, go down and see it. Now, our speaker tonight, Kingsport native, she was, somebody's laughing back there, they must know her. Where did you see? But uh, Barbara uh, worked at Eastman. She went into education, teaching. She was a, an assistant principal. She was on the uh, school board. She is a published author. And uh, she takes care of Wilson. But one of the biggest things, the biggest things I think of, she was one of King Sports original Broad Street brands. <laughs> so make Barbara welcome tonight. Yes. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Obviously, we couldn't do this show without Kenny. He's our technological guru. He loves the pictures and does such a good job. And I don't get anywhere without Wilson. He drives Miss Daisy around. Um, we picked, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me all right? I can talk really loud. Uh, we picked the topic Broad Street from Church Circle to the train station 1945 to 1975 because we wanted to limit the time period to the boom time in Kingsport and across the country after World War II. Most cities in the, in the United States boomed. Kingsport was no exception. And it the retail commercial area became what Mr. Johnson and John B. Dennis and planner John Nolan had envisioned. It, and I'm sure many of the pictures we show you tonight are going to be so familiar to you because many of you were here after World War II working. If you just came to Kingsport at that time, a lot of this will have meaning. Now, we have to start with the picture of our founders. In the middle, of course, Mr. Johnson, J. Fred Johnson. I remember him all what, very little about him, except that he always seemed rumpled to me. His clothes seemed rumpled. Uh, to his left, of course, John B. Dennis and to his right, Pearly Wilcox. Now, um, Mr. Johnson, known as the father of Kingsport, came here from Hillsville, Virginia. He came because his brother-in-law, George Carter, recruited him to come and help buy property for a railroad. George Carter, who is not pictured, was one of the three movers and shakers. George wanted a railroad coming from Cleveland, Ohio, down through the Virginias and Kentucky into South Carolina. When he got that railroad in 1915, it was done, he went back to the coal fields. He had what he wanted. He left J. Fred here in Kingsport, and in the meantime, J. Fred had hooked up with John B. Dennis of the Blair Corporation in New York City. They'd gone to the Blair Corporation to get money to build the railroad. This is how J. Fred met John B. Dennis. John B. Dennis wanted to be a player. That's really what he wanted to be. He was northern money. 
and J. Fred needed northern money. We had good workers in the south, uh, but we needed northern money, and they needed it for the railroad. So when J. Fred said to John B. Dennis, we're going to build a town, Dennis was interested. And that is how the, the two of them, after George Carter got what he wanted and opted out, the two of them carried on. Now, <laughs> it's widely known that John B. Dennis was deaf. <laughs> so he wanted J. Fred to be a one-man chamber of commerce. J. Fred was the mouthpiece. And that suited J. Fred just fine. That worked. Um, when they got incorporated in 1917, we're going to talk Broad Street. In 1917, in this country, only 7% of the country was paved. Roads, 7%. Now, <clears throat> John B. Dennis wrote in his diary in 1917, he said, we finally got a curb and a sidewalk and a little narrow street. That was Broad Street. But, I mean, Kingsport was a muddy mess. And, and it was a frontier town. I mean, you know, I've said this before. The first sheriff got drunker than everybody else one Saturday night. He got fired. The second sheriff got shot. <laughs> and finally, J. Fred went to the city manager and said, you know, we got to clean the town up. They didn't even have a town. Um, but Broad Street, next time you drive down it, think to yourself, it was not built for cars. It was built for carriages. Fortunately, fortunately, what they're doing in this picture, Kenny pointed out to me, this is 1938. They're taking the wide median out of it. It had the big grassy median. They're taking that out, which it gave us Broad Street. Now, by 1920, the lots on Broad Street were selling for $10,000 each. That was high cotton. Every lot was 25 feet wide. That was part of the plan. So that, that much planning they had going. Now, are we going to the train station? We're going down the train station. Oh, this, this is, in this pretty? This is just pretty. Clinton McKenzie designed that. He was an architect that they got out of New Jersey. Clinton McKenzie designed it. Lola Anderson, who married John B. Dennis when he was 63 years old, he had never been married. <laughs> she was 44. I think J. Fred engineered that. Um, Lola had been hired as the landscaper for Kingsport. Uh, she was a graduate of Cornell had a master's degree in landscaping, noticed the pretty stuff. But the train station went on one end abroad. That was, you know, every town had to have your transportation. So Clinton McKenzie put that thing up there, and back of it, of course, is Seamen Hill, where all the Penn Dixie houses were, where Foreman John Kiss and his family lived and had a boarding house for all the Hungarian workers. Now let's go to the other end of Broad Street. This, well, no, the power company. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Uh, Alan Dryden did this one. Alan Dryden Sr., beautiful building, the power company. Across the street from that, the inn, the Kingsport Inn, every town had to have a hotel. This was built in 1917. It was raised in 1960. In 1917, it's where everybody lived. Leroy Sprinkle, the football coach, lived there. My mother came to town as a teacher in the early 30s. The teachers all lived there because there wasn't any housing in Kingsport. So the inn also uh, Clinton... McKenzie design. 
So now on one end of Broad, you got the train station. On the other end, you got a hotel, a power company, and then the post office. This was designed by a New Yorker, Thomas Hastings. Um, was dedicated to Mr. Johnson in 61. Uh, so now you've got everything that you need on a main street to get started for your businesses and your commerce, only you need money. So we've got the bank. Now then, <coughs> Mr. Johnson recruited from Marion, Virginia in 1916, a teller. His name was A.D. Brockman. And A.D. came down here in 1916 to be the teller at the bank. There was another bank before the Depression called the Farmer's Bank, but it went under during the Depression. First National absorbed it. Um, Mr. Brockman made it through the Depression with the bank, and in the late, uh, late 30s, he hired Pat Basinger from West Tennessee to come in as head cashier. Now, Basinger had worked for a bank during the Depression that had failed. And after that, he got a job with bank examiners. So Brockman figured he would be a good bet to keep the bank level. Next thing that happened, Mr. Johnson recruited W.B. Green to come to town to open a department store. But W.B. Green's heart was in banking. He came to Kingsport and did open a department store that we all remember over on Center Street, but he had banking interests in, Carolina, in the Carolinas. So he was making loans to people who wanted to start businesses himself out of this North Carolina bank. So we're making loans now. The money's flowing. Um, Mr. Brockman, we all remember, he's kind of your typical banker, the man in the gray flannel suit type thing. Uh, but he had one hobby most people didn't know about. He and Dr. Tipton would sneak away to New York City to see the New York Yankees play <laughs> any time he could get loose because he had a younger brother who had played in the minors. So he was banking and baseball, A.D. Brockman. All right, now we're going to the businesses. In 45... This store was on Broad Street, Sobel's. It was in business over on Center Street till 2000. My daddy used to say, people, nobody, nobody was born in Kingsport. Everybody came from somewhere else. He said most of them came out of the coal fields and had dirt under their fingernails. Those that didn't came out of farms, and he said a few of them came from other countries. <laughs> the Sobels, Morris and Harry, were a case in point. Uh, in 1914, a man who was a tailor in a small town outside of Warsaw, Poland, immigrated to New York City. He expected to bring his family immediately. But World War I happened. So it was 1919 before his family could get to Ellis Island. Wife and five children, three daughters, two sons, came into Ellis Island and the 13-year-old son named Harry was stopped because he had a scalp infection. So here's this 13-year-old who speaks only Polish, and he's held on Ellis Island while the rest of the family goes through. Fortunately, 
that didn't last too long and he got reunited with the family in New York. They lived on 5th Street. The children went sporadically to a grammar school, but the, they needed money, of course. The dad was a tailor. So the two boys became diamond runners. Now what that meant was, in those days, rough cut diamonds were coming into New York City to importers. They had to be taken across town to cutters, jewelry cutters. Now, children would never have been suspicious at all carrying diamonds. So these two boys made their money carrying diamonds, rough ones from the importers to the cutters. Now, eventually Morris married and moved to Lynchburg. He really wasn't real happy he, there, and he kept asking people, uh, where's a good opportunity? Where's a good place to go? And he heard Northeast Tennessee. <laughs> I think they told him Elizabethton, but Morris got on the train and he went too far. <laughs> he ended up in Kingsport, and he was getting a cup of coffee trying to figure out what to do next, and a man offered him a job in a coffee shop. So Mars took the job in a store that was on Broad Street called the Economy Store. Before long, he had the opportunity to buy it. So with $500 from his family and $500 from A.D. Brockman, he bought the Economy Store and he sent for Harry, his brother. Now, those of us who remember Morris, remember he was very personable, very outgoing, uh, a salesman. Harry was quiet, bookish, but very good at math and bookkeeping. So the two of them together opened a high-end men's clothing shop, which was Sobel's. Their son, uh, Harry's son, Sonny, whom Carolyn and I grew up with, Sonny told me that their name was Sobolski. And, of course, it went Polish, and they had it changed in Greenville. He said they went down to Greenville and had it changed to Sobol. Uh, <clears throat> next to that, we got Fuller and Hillman. Yeah, you ready to go there? Yeah. That's still up. I think that's been changed to Blakely Mitchell, but the FH is still up on the building. Uh, Ray Hillman came to Kingsport in 1920, lived at the Homestead Hotel. He and I.M. Fuller started that business. Now, they, they both came from the coal fields. Uh, both had been in retailing in commissaries. Hillman and Clinch Co. with the Clinchfield Commissary, and I am Hillman in Appalachia. So that, that was true to form, you know, come in from the coal fields and start a business. Uh, next to that, are we going to do Cressus next? Oh, this is good. Let me get a drink of water. Cut us off TV. Now, we all know that Chris is here is not hometown. That's not hometown. But the inventory and the things we bought at Chris's were brought in here by a hometown person. In about the mid-30s, Ward King figured out that he couldn't make any money if he sent a truck somewhere and it came home empty. And he realized that he was going to have, if he was going to stay in the trucking business, he was going to have to send a truck one way loaded and back loaded. Well, he had a truck going to New York City. So he, decided, he knew that the headquarters of Cresses was in New York City and the transportation department was there too. 
So he bought a cheap suit, always a mistake, and he got in his car and he drove ahead of that truck to New York. He got into New York and he got, he got an appointment the next day with the head of transportation at Cress's. <clears throat> next morning, he really didn't have the money for a cab and he thought he could walk over. Well, he was doing fine until it started raining <laughs> and his suit started shrinking. <laughs> <clears throat> so he gets over to Cress's, he gets in to see the head of transportation and he says, I've got a truck coming. I can, you've got a store on the main street of my town. I could load my truck with inventory and take it back to Broad Street in my town. And he said as he was talking, his suit kept shrinking. <laughs> he said he didn't know if the man felt sorry for him or was embarrassed for him. But <clears throat> he said, we'll load your truck. You can send it back to Broad Street in your town. And eventually, of course, Ward King got more business that way, too. Uh, we need to go across the street now, don't we? Okay. Do we? In those days, there were two lady shops. We got another one, the Diana. <laughs> You're good, Kenny. You're good. Uh... When you talk about Kingsport, people have asked me, and starting with Wilson, he said, Barbara, you talk about all these men who started the town. Uh, where were the women? Well, I'll tell you where they were. <clears throat> Middle class and upper class women were not supposed to work in Kingsport. Um, you might think that Kingsport was such a wild and woolly town that it would have been like Montana and Wyoming and the women would have been in harness, but it wasn't because, remember, the men who founded this town were cavaliers from Virginia. The southern stereotype. My mother lost her job when she married in the mid-30s. Uh-huh. If you were married, you couldn't have a job. And some of the women who came in here from the north with their husbands were very appalled by this. Um, but downtown, there were two lady shops in the 50s. They were staffed by women, managed by women, not owned by women, but run by women. The Diana and the Betty Gay. The Betty Gay went to the mall in 76 and subsequently went out of business. The Diana shop left Broad Street. These were mid-priced lady shops. I had a friend who worked at the Betty Gay when she was in high school and she said, I'll tell you what the hot item was. The hot item was the perfect circle skirt with a poodle and a chain. <laughs> and she said, we sold them like hot cakes for two ninety eight each. Uh, she said, uh, and the, the, uh, the person who had the highest sales for the day, the reward was a silver dollar. She said, I got several silver dollars. Okay, uh, where are we going now? Johnny Harrison's. Johnny didn't get taken into World War II, so he came home and he and his dad opened a shoe store. Uh, the, <laughs> probably the, when I was talking to his son uh, about this, he said the most exciting thing they had was that x-ray machine where the kids would come in, you could stick your feet in and see your bones in your feet. <laughs> Burr said, can you imagine having something like that in your store now? <laughs> You'd be sued before noon. <laughs> um, Johnny's store, uh, it was mentioned to me about this, um, all of the stores, 
on Broad Street. All the stores were damaged, almost all were damaged, when the aniline plant at Eastman exploded. Harrison's Bootery particularly. Uh, I mean, all the windows were blown in. Um, <clears throat> you know, the town just <laughs> was in everything together. Um, shall we go to the baby shop? Uh-huh. See this? The baby shop. That's Wallace's News. <laughs> and Wallace's News was in there. But it shared a marquee with the baby shop because there was a baby shop upstairs. A little incongruous because <coughs> there was a pool table in the back and you had to go by the pool top go through the pool hall to get up to the baby shop. <coughs> Wallace Crumb had bought Wall and isn't it interesting, Wallace's remains on uh, Broad Street, I went in and talked to Troy Brown recently, and, and I said, Troy, what, what are you selling these days? And he said, well, newspapers, magazines, a few tobacco products, and our famous popcorn. <laughs> uh, the uh, Wallace Crumb had gotten his start across the street with Paul Nottingham, in the palace. Now we all remember the palace. <laughs> the boys hung out there and the girls chased them. Uh, Paul Nottingham came in here from Kansas in about 1920. He brought his grandmother to Scott County because she wanted to come see her people. He thought he was going on to Florida, but he ran out of money. He was trained as a barber so over he came to Kingsport and got a job at the Palace Barbershop, which was a 12-chair barbershop. And you say, why did they have 12 chairs in little old Kingsport in 1920? Well, the men got their hair cut once a week. <laughs> There was also a shoe shine stand in that place. And I remember in the back right hand corner by the 40s, there was a tailor shop. And you could go in, you get your hair cut, shaved, shoes shined, get the tailor to press your clothes. You could go out of there looking like a million dollars. The, the tailor was named Nathan Berlin. And I, the reason I know that, P.T. Nottingham didn't know that. I kind of one-upped him on that one. Uh, I, I was sent over to the tailor shop a lot by my dad with men's clothing that was supposed to be altered. And so I would go in the tailor shop and Mr. Berlin would be in the back pressing and sewing and he would say to me, Ah, oh, my darling Margaret. <laughs> and I would say, but Mr. Berlin, my name's Barbara. And he'd smile. The next week, I would go in <laughs> with a load of clothes, and he would say, Ah, oh, my darling Margaret. <laughs> he evidently had something about that name. He never did get it. However, not, there was, the barbershop was a going thing until the Depression. When the Depression hit, people didn't get their hair cut once a week. Paul and three other barbers bought the place and they extended the front into Palace Fruit and News. Now at this point, people were very interested in getting newspapers. The Depression was on, the country was in trouble. During the war, just like Jimmy's Candy Kitchen, Nottingham kept that place open 24 hours a day. The palace stayed open. Uh, P.T. and Johnny were kids, they worked in it. P.T. said he only made $5 a week. I said, well, 
<laughs> you came through all right, PT. Um, but the thing that made the great difference for them happened in 1948. Paul Nottingham bought a pinball machine. And he put it in, and every, every boy in Kingsport... This thing is making a funny noise, isn't it? Not you. Okay. <laughs> Probably. Uh, every, every boy in Kingsport was very interested in the pinball machine. So the next thing Nottingham did was put in a jukebox, and the next thing was a cigarette machine, and the sky was the limit. All the kids in town were hanging around at the palace. That was also the beginning of the palace vending business, which uh, they, in 48, coffee machines uh, came into being. They bought in. They put them at Blue Ridge Glass. They put them at Halston Mills. By the mid-50s, they had to move the vending part of the business up to Main Street. Uh, but that by 63, the palace closed on Broad Street. There wasn't enough walking traffic. TV had arrived. Okay. Are we going to do Jay Fred's? No, Dominus Taylor. Dominus Taylor. Dominus Taylor. Boy, how did Jay Fred up? You want to do Jay Fred? No, I'll come back. <laughs> Can you go back to it in a minute? Yeah, we'll get back. Okay. G.W. Taylor and Flem Dobbins, who had both worked at, for J. Fred in the big store. Flem had been in charge of furniture and GW hardware. They bought that store in 22. It was a failing hardware store. And they enlarged it and they added sporting goods and appliances. And in 1952, they were summoned to Washington to receive an award as being the largest volume sales of hardware of any privately owned store in the United States. Of course, you got to remember, they were selling hardware to all the industries. They had a big wholesale hardware store out back across the street. Uh, so they were quite successful with that. Um, now you ready to go back? Yeah, we'll go back to Jay Fred's. Okay. This came to Broad Street in the mid-30s. It was gone by 55. Uh, Jay Fred's was the big store renamed. The big store had been on Main and Shelby. That's where my dad came to work in 1925. Um, it moved to this store in the mid-30s and was sort of the premier department store in Upper East Tennessee. The first manager was Mr. W.W. W. Hufford. The one that I remember is Mr. Sam Anderson. Um, he was in charge of the men's department and hired my dad. And then he became the manager. Uh, <laughs> he was a, a one of 10 children. He had seven sisters. All of them went to college. There were three boys. All of them went to work. <laughs> he was very civic-minded, uh, very personable, very affable. My dad was the assistant manager, and they were opposites. My dad was kind of high energy, nervous, let's get it done. Well, <laughs> he got in over his head. That late in 45, with the war winding down, nobody could find anything to sell. The war effort in the Pacific and Europe had taken everything. So Sam Anderson called my dad in the office and he said, Bob, you have to go to New York and you've got to find us something to sell. Well, now you know as well as I do what that meant. That meant the black market. <laughs> uh, uh, my dad was a can-do type, but he wasn't very heroic. And he was very worried that he was going to be running interference with the mob. <laughs> so he came home. I'm just a kid. 
and he tells mother we're going on a wonderful week's vacation to New York. <laughs> it wasn't a vacation. We were up and down back alleys and back steps. He took us to cover. I guess he thought the mob will not kill a man if his wife and child is alone. <laughs> But Ed Ellington later told me that he remembered when word spread out at Eastman, go downtown, Bob Gott has suits. <laughs> so it did work. Uh, in 55, the store was sold. This is after Mr. Johnson had died in 44. Uh, it was sold to the Moore Brothers of Chattanooga. Uh, who owned Loveman's, and they thought they were going to s do several stores and found out later that one was one too many. Uh, they moved it down the street and before long sold to Miller's, which went to the mall. Okay? Oh, we got so commercial here. We got so cosmopolitan here. <laughs> they are nails. After the war, if you walked in Baylor and Elms, and some of you probably remember this, looked like an old country store. Stoves and furniture kind of all around and a yellow delivery truck that says, we install linoleum. <laughs> but in 56, Hugh Nelms decided to upgrade. So, he did. And suddenly they had rooms of dining room furniture and bedroom furniture and name brands. And Bale Nelms was very upgraded. But the upshot of all of it came when American Saint-Gobain brought French families in here to work. And they told these families that they were going to take them to Bale Nelms and their every need would be taken care of. Dishes, bedding, furniture, decorations. No one at Baylor Nelm spoke one word of French. <laughs> but they got the job done. They got it done. They outfitted those houses, and all of a sudden, Kingsport was cosmopolitan. <laughs> Last thing, oh, we got the Littman brothers, Henry Littman and Adolph, Jewel Box and Jordans. Uh, it should be said that in those days, the people who, were own, who owned stores and managed stores were friends. They were reciprocal. They, they were not competitive with each other. Hugh Nelms ate lunch every day with Adolph and Henry Littman, who owned the jewelry stores. I remember when uh, J. Fred's burned in 48 because the Strand Theater caught on fire. So the top floor of J. Fred's burned. And I remember my dad saying that every owner of every store came by to volunteer whatever they could do that would help. There was that feeling that it, you know, this is our town, this is our street, and this is our business. Um, we can't finish without looking at Joe Heller. This is Joe in his younger days. He started with a loan office, a pawn shop, and he parlayed that into Joseph's Music Center. And if you had a kid who was ever in the band, you dealt with Joe Heller. So it's supposedly he, he sold Maybelle Carter her first auto harp. Joe was a very good community uh, servant. He was instrumental in the Kingsport Symphony. He was instrumental in the Kingsport Community Band. And finally, I believe we have, coming down the street, 42, did you say 1940. 40? 1940, 1940. The Dobbins Bennett Band. <laughs> you were there. I was there. You were there. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> did you know Ken Fincher? Yes. I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> okay. Ken Fincher was the drum major 
between 40 and 42. Of course, the DB band was the first uniformed ba high school band in the state of Tennessee. First one. Ken Fincher was the drum major, and he got a scholarship to be drum major at the University of Kentucky. That wasn't all. He went into the Coast Guard, and he was the drum major of the United States Coast Guard Band. So, you know, <laughs> we have exported a lot of people who've done extremely well from our town. When Mr. Johnson and John B. Dennis both were gone in the 40s, the baton had to be passed. And it was. It was. Between 45 and 75, things boomed. After the mall was built, Kingsport has had a period of what do we do now, what do we put downtown. Um, the baton has had to be passed again for Kingsport to have downtown offices, banks, restaurants, educational facilities, and other things. It's still in the process of being redone. I think any time that we wonder about what's going to happen to Kingsport, we just have to look at the fountain in Glen Bruce Park. Uh, Lola Dennis gave the money for that fountain, and she wanted it named the Founder's Fountain. And it's very lovely, it's very pretty, and a testimony to all the work that was put into the town from the very beginning. Now, the band is going to New York City in two weeks, and we'll be able to turn on our TVs to watch the Santa Parade and watch the Indians. And Jean, you can say, I'm here watching it. <laughs> and with that, Kenny and I appreciate your attention and appreciate your coming to our program. We're through. That's all.